Hey everyone, for this DO training block, we're going to be doing a review of the 2016 uh, major emphasis training, kind of going over some flow test stuff, uh, some hydraulics, um, stuff you'll find in the DO manual as just kind of a refresher. So um, I'll try to keep this as short as I can. There's a lot of content here, so I'll, I'll try to keep it short. If you guys ever have any questions about this stuff, contact myself or Hal. Um, we're always happy to talk about it. Um, it's, it's, it's good, interesting stuff. So um, let's get into it. So just keeping in mind with where we're at, we have this new... Um, uh, driver operator training schedule where it's split into two years and things are divided so right now we're in year one September October um, and we have this uh, MET review which is what we're doing right now so that's kind of why we're doing this so our objectives today as they always are are going to be depth of knowledge um, it's really important that everybody understand the why behind everything that we do and that's kind of what we're after here so uh, seeking that depth of knowledge we're going to talk about nozzles Principles of hydraulics, tire, target fire flow principles, uh, and pumping operations. Um, this would be a good video to watch as a, as a crew um, if you have the time and are, you guys are willing. Um, I, think, I think there's something in this that everybody on the crew can benefit as a bit of a review. So, uh, getting into it. So when you calculate total line pressure, we always work from the nozzle back, right? So we work nozzle pressure, friction loss, appliance, elevation, and that gives us our total line pressure. So that's the format we're gonna follow for this class just because it kind of makes sense as we present the material. Um, so starting at the nozzle, we need to understand a couple things about nozzles, right? First is nozzle reaction, what that is, and then the second is nozzles, what they do, how they work, how they function, and that's important as a DL, right? So uh, getting into nozzle reaction, what is nozzle reaction? Well, it's uh, Newton's third law um, in, in motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's the force we feel uh, when water and pressure come out of the nozzle as firefighters as we're, as we're managing the nozzle. It's that force we feel. So uh, how we get that um, pressure, it's a relationship between uh, GPM and PSI. So as GPM increase or PSI increase, uh, that increases our nozzle reaction. Um, I think about it a little bit like a gun, like if you have a, just a 22 long rifle, you've got a small bullet with a small charge, and when I shoot that, I don't feel much kickback. But if I take the same bullet and I do a 22 250, which is a small bullet, same bullet, and essentially the same bullet, and then a larger cartridge on it, larger, more powder, more velocity, more pressure, uh, I do feel a lot of kick with that, even though my, my bullet size hasn't really changed that much. So that's kind of what nozzle reaction is. So as pressure or velocity increases, our nozzle reaction increases, and then as flow or the size of our bullet increases, that also increases nozzle reaction. So that's kind of what it is, and it's a relationship. So if either one of those goes up, nozzle reaction goes up. If either one of those goes down, nozzle reaction goes down. Um, there's a lot of studies out there that talk about how much nozzle reaction a single firefighter can handle. Um, those numbers float around a little bit, but the numbers we kind of use for the DO manual and when we teach this class are 70 pounds for one firefighter, 80 pounds for two firefighters, three firefighters is about 90 pounds. And then once you get beyond about 100 pounds of nozzle reaction, you're really not in that kind of mobile attack line environment anymore. You're more in a defensive line. So um, much above that, and we really need to start thinking about uh, using other tools available to us to help us manage nozzle reactions, such as the design of a nozzle like a blitz fire, which is designed to put those nozzle reaction forces down into the ground, or a street set, or a deck gun, or something like that. So um, our target, all that said, is to try to keep our nozzle reaction under that 70 pounds. And that's what one, nozzle, one firefighter can you know, handle effectively, and the key word with that is effectively. Um, if you're, well, studies have shown that if you over pump a firefighter, you give them too much nozzle reaction, uh, they're so busy dealing with that that they're not doing all the other stuff that a firefighter needs to manage. They're not paying attention to impending signs of flashover, radio traffic, orientation within the building, how the floor feels underneath them, fire behavior, all the stuff that we need to pay attention to inside of a building. If we're fighting nozzle reaction, we're not doing that. So um, I know that there's a lot of people who can manage a lot more nozzle reaction than that, um, and that's great, but what we're trying to do is is get, is is have a fire flow and a nozzle reaction that everybody can handle um, and also be effective on the fire ground, which, so we're staying underneath that 70 pounds. Um, what they find in the studies is that if you present more nozzle reaction than that to a firefighter, that leads to the firefighter getting back, uh, which takes the bullets out of our gun quite literally. Um, you know, we don't no longer have the flow, the very specific target fire flow of 180 GPM that we've picked. If we get back, we no longer have that flow. So, uh, so that's kind of detrimental and counterintuitive to what we want to do. So uh, remember, water is leaving the nozzle at 60 miles an hour. That's pretty remarkable. That's a high speed that it's leaving the nozzle. So uh, that kind of attributes to our nozzle reaction. 
Uh, as a DO, you have a direct effect uh, and control over nozzle reaction, and thus firefighter safety. Uh, if we over pump, right, that's a firefighter safety issue because we're giving them too much nozzle reaction. Uh, they're not doing all the other things they need to do. And if we under pump, we're not providing the necessary DPM to potentially combat flashover. So those are both life safety issues. So uh, accurate pressures are super critical and something we'll keep coming back to you throughout this presentation. So we have a bunch of different types of nozzles. We have fog nozzles, smooth bore, we have our fog mills, and then a bunch of other nozzles that we don't really have at PFA. But I, they're getting in the vernacular of the fire service and more and more people are, are talking about them. So I just kind of want uh, to give a very brief overview of, of what they are. So if you read about them or hear about them, you kind of know what's going on. So one of the first nozzles in that category is a fixed gallonage nozzle. So these operate a lot like a smooth bore. It's a fog nozzle, uh, but it's got a fixed gallonage. So you'll hear, you'll commonly hear people say it's a 160 at 50 or it's a 180 at 70. And what they're saying is that is it's a, it's a 160 GPM nozzle at 50 PSI or it's a 180 GPM nozzle at 70 PSI. And manufacturers can really play with those numbers uh, to, uh, with, with all sorts of desired effects. Um, and the, the key points with that is if you operate outside of that range, just like with a smoothbore nozzle, much outside of that range, um, you'll start getting poor nozzle stream. You know, your stream won't be, uh, have the reach it wants um, or the reach you want. Um, so there's advantages and disadvantages. A lot of the advantages and disadvantages they share uh, with smoothbore nozzles. But when you compare a fixed gallonage nozzle to an automatic nozzle, it's a much more simple device. There's less uh, things going on within it. So, um, so that's an advantage. So um, we don't have any at PFA. Um, it's just something to kind of be aware of. They're out there in the fire service. Uh, you'll read a lot of articles talking about them when you read flow studies and things like that. So just so you know what they are. There's also adjustable gallonage nozzles. Um, when I did wildland, we used to use these on the booster lines uh, for a running attack. They're a great tool because you can basically select your, your gallonage right there. So when I used to use it for a running attack, you know, it would be you know, 40 gallons, 30, 20, 10, and with each click of the selector ring, uh, you could gate, essentially gate back your nozzle uh, with a known flow and use the least amount of water possible, which can obviously be advantageous for wildland. So we don't have any of those here, uh, just a kind of a, a knowledge that they're out there. Um, switching to what we do have, uh, we have our fog mills kind of starting with that. Remember these are 200 PSI at 30 GPM, regardless of the configuration. Uh, we're exploring maybe playing with these numbers a little bit, maybe bringing that pressure down a little bit, uh, but when that comes out, um, we'll obviously talk about it. So uh, remember, these are low GPM nozzles, only 30 GPM, and when we're flowing, we're only flowing them for, for 10 seconds. So we're not getting a, a large volume of water uh, within whatever space we're, we're flowing them in. Um, some things to remember, which I know this is a review for everybody. Uh, we have two patterns. We have our fog nail attack pattern, which is much like a traditional fog, um, fog nozzle. And then we've also got our restrictor pattern, which is much more like a sprinkler. Um, I think the key point to think about this as a DO is, as, as a DO, um, we're gonna probably be the ones that are putting these nozzles on at a fire. So um, that's gonna be up to us. When we get to a fire and we're like, man, this is an attic fire, this might kind of go a fog nail direction, uh, it'd be really advantageous for, for us to make that decision. Okay, I'm gonna spin off that automatic nozzle off of the uh, booster line. I'm gonna spin on the appropriate fog nail based on what we're seeing, how are we gonna use it, and then prep that and get it ready. That's something that uh, in our order of operations as a DO and a fire scene, we can kind of get ready. And then thinking about how to prep these things too. Um, I think when these first came out, I was definitely in the boat of just like, oh, it's just easy. You throw it on there and you go use it. But there's a little more to it than that. Just thinking about how they're deployed, uh, whether they need a, a roof package if they're going to the roof, whether we're using them on the inside, poking a hole just through the ceiling. Um, but one of the keys to that is that the hose is coming off of a reel. So if you're trying to make it deployable for forward crews, you don't want to just get the fog nail at the front door or wherever it's going to be deployed and then just leave that line. You want to go back and get line off of that reel and get it into the front yard so, um, so it's movable, so it's deployable, so that the, the attack crew isn't, isn't pulling it off the reel from their location. So just something to think about as you're prepping these as a DO. Um, kind of talked about a lot of these, I got ahead of myself. Um, thinking about foam use with these, remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to gas cool if we're in a uh, enclosed environment, which is where we're typically deploying these. So uh, if we're trying to gas cool, um, I don't think the, the foam's gonna hurt all that much, but um, remember we're looking for those tiny droplets of water and probably the best way to achieve that in an enclosed environment is gonna be to, use, to not use foam with these. Now that's not to say you never use foam with them. And once again, that's really, kind of falls on the DO. Nobody's really gonna be telling you this. This is all stuff you're gonna have to think about. 
Um, Engine 8 had a great example where they used a fog nail um, on a car fire. They were able to just puncture it right through the hood and flood it, and they used foam, and it worked great. So that would be an example where you would want to do that. Uh, something to think about with this, we're running the pump at a super high pressure, 200 PSI, and we're flowing a super low volume of water, and not flowing continuously, because whether they're in a closed environment in an attic or a car where you're flowing a little more continuously, you know, you're only flowing 30 gallons a minute, and especially if you're in an enclosed environment, you're only flowing for 10 seconds and then you're not, and your pump's just wrapping out huge RPMs. So I know we've got the pump recirc lines on the engines, and that's that little, um, usually there's that little uh, <clears throat> knob underneath, uh, like the five inch intake, uh, and it'll say like pump recirc on it. Uh, that's usually just a small, you know, three eighths, quarter inch line that's recircling the water in the pump. That might not be enough to keep your pump cool. So uh, if you're using these, it might be a good idea to keep that recirc line open uh, for your tank fill specifically um, to keep some more water flowing because we're not flowing a lot of water with these. I think that's what I had there. <clears throat> Moving on to smoothbore nozzles. Um, Nozzle pressure for these uh, typically is 50 PSI at the hand line for a hand line and 80 PSI for a master stream. Uh, these are becoming debatable in the fire service. There's a lot of departments that are choosing to over or under pump these nozzles depending on um, kind of what their uh, achieved, what their goal is. So a lot of departments on their two and a half lines. So for example, right now we're using an inch and a quarter and an inch and eight tip on our two and a half. Some departments are just going to an inch and three sixteenths and then treating that a little bit like an automatic nozzle and they'll pump it a little hot if they need more water and they'll pump it a little light if they need less. So um, so these uh, 50s and 80s aren't, aren't steadfast and we see an example of that at PFA in our high rise pack. Uh, with our high rise pack, we've opted for a 45 pound uh, nozzle pressure on an inch and an eighth tip which brings our flow from 266 down to 252, which matches the GPM of, that the standpipe's designed to, to give us. So, um, so just know that these are debatable. They're not steadfast. You get much outside of 10 PSI in either direction, and you're gonna start seeing um, pretty significant stream uh, deterioration um, as far as your quality, your reach, things like that. So just things to think about. Um, remember our flow rates are dictated uh, by the nozzle pressure. So, um, Flow rate for a smoothbore nozzle, if you put 50 pounds on an inch and eighth tip, you will get exactly 266 GPM. Uh, so much so that that's how we calibrate flow meters. So when we do uh, pump tests or flow tests and things like that, we'll use an inch and eighth tip, we'll pedo it at 50 PSI exactly, and we should get exactly 266 GPM. And that's how we know our flow meters are, are functioning correctly. So um, when you look at when you go from a hand line to a master stream, you know, this is the chart on our engine with our tip sizes and whatnot. Uh, if you read an IFSTA book, it's gonna tell you the breakover from a, a hand line to a master stream is about 350 GPM. I personally think that's way too high. Once you get, man, much above that inch and an eighth hand line, that 266, maybe just a touch more, you're really at that breakover line where you should be using that line defensively in order to, be, to, to maintain effectiveness. So, um, I don't know, just a little nugget to throw in there. And just remember, 50 GPM, as you go from 50 GPM increments, that's a lot of mass. Uh, you know, water weighs over eight pounds a gallon, so that's a lot of mass leaving the nozzle. And going back to our gun analogy, we're increasing the size of our bullet, increasing our nozzle reaction. So uh, a very small increase uh, can have a very drastic effect in our nozzle reaction. And typically, because these uh, smoothbore nozzles are used on higher flow hand lines anyway, uh, we're already kind of uh, riding the lightning, so to speak. We're already pushing that limit of nozzle reaction. And so uh, just a little bit more can really have a drastic, uh, drastic effect. Advantages of smoothbore nozzle, uh, they pass debris, right? Debris can pass right through them. That's why we're using them right now in a, in a high rise application. They're super tough. It's a pipe with a ball valve on it. Uh, there's really nothing to them. They're practically maintenance free, huge advantages. Some disadvantages, um, they have a lower back pressure. You have a larger orifice size coming out of the um, end of the nozzle when compared to like an automatic nozzle when you look at like the overall orifice size. So you have less back pressure in the line, meaning pressure that's stored in the line when water is flowing, and that can create kinking issues. Um, so a lot of uh, departments that use smoothbore nozzles uh, have more staffing and they manage those kinks a little bit differently. So um, not a reason not to use them, uh, it's just something to think about when you use them, they, have, they kink easier. Uh, but that's why at PFA we're trying to staff our two and a half uh, with two crews, even our two inch uh, on a high rise application. We're trying to staff that with two crews to help manage uh, not just that higher nozzle reaction in the higher flow line, but also the other things that come with that. So, um, you know, your, uh, your increased uh, staffing you need for um, managing the line itself. And then uh, 
an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on how you look at it, is that any pressure reduction equals a loss of stream quality. I talked a little bit about that with the fixed gallonage nozzle. So those that view that as an advantage say, um, if I go into an environment, I flow water and something's happened, a kink in the line, the pump's malfunction, something's happened where I've decreased uh, flow, I can see that or, fe or feel it more in my, or I can see it in my nozzle stream. My nozzle stream is gonna deteriorate and now that's a sign that something's happened, that's a sign I need to retreat. Um, those that's in the camp that say that's a disadvantage say, well, now you can't, you don't have anything. You have no water, you can get where you want it because your stream is deteriorated. So um, I think they're both valid. I think they're both pros and cons of a tool, just like any tool that we have, there's pros and cons. It's just a matter of knowing how your tool is going to react in that situation um, and kind of being ready to, to have a plan B or know what you're gonna do. So just things to think about with the smoothbore nozzle. Um, there's a fallacy out there about reach. Um, <clears throat> smoothbore nozzles just don't, uh, I've always heard smoothbore nozzles have greater reach and penetration. Uh, and that's just not true. So uh, per our own flow tests, per our own reach tests, uh, we've disproved that. There's a ton of videos you can see online. Uh, the PowerPoint's attached. If you wanna watch this video, you can see a good one that kind of demonstrates that. Um, as far as the penetration side of that, I'm not exactly sure where that myth came from. Um, penetration has everything to do with water velocity. So your, your pressure of water leaving the nozzle and then your GPM, which ultimately determines your droplet size and the diameter of your hose stream. So the larger diameter hose stream you have, the more penetration you're gonna have because those droplets of water and even a smooth bore nozzle um, isn't just a continuous column of water, it's made up of droplets of water, right? So as those droplets of water go through a hot environment, um, the, the, the thicker your hose stream and the more robust it is, the more it can withstand evaporation forces um, as it goes through the, the heated environment. So a larger droplet of water is gonna fare better getting through a superheated environment uh, while it's gas cooling on its way to surface cooling when it lands on the fuel. So um, I, I, I just want to just make sure everyone's clear that reach and penetration are, are not an issue um, with, with when you compare fog versus smooth bore. It's just a myth and I'm not sure why it's still a thing. So we did our own reach tests. Uh, there's lots of videos out there that disprove this. This is a picture right out of the, well, not, it's a modified picture out of the DO manual. But as you can see, like when we look at our blitz and standard pressure, versus our blitz with an inch and three eighths, um, versus a blitz with an inch and a half. You know, here's our fog nozzle. We actually had a little bit better performance uh, with the fog nozzle, but you gotta think about, and especially with all these, you know, we're looking at the 200 foot mark, 150, 100 feet, with all these, whether we're looking at a blitz fire, a smooth bore um, on a <clears throat> two and a half, or more of the inch and three quarter, once you're out here, you're really raining down. You know what I mean? And that's no matter what nozzle type you have on there, whether you have a stream straightener or not, smooth bore versus fog, that last bit of your stream is really not a super effective fire stream in the sense that your water's not all landing in the same place. Um, so that's just, you know, something to be aware of. Um, if we kind of come down, just this is a lot of stuff on this chart to kind of simplify this. We look at like um, an inch and three quarter inch standard versus low pressure or when compared to a one inch um, tip, which we were using at the time, which has a fairly similar uh, flow characteristic uh, as that 180 GPM category. And you can see that they're all about the same. And we see that the standard pressure has more of a rain down effect because we're pumping this at 100 PSI and thus creating a smaller water droplet and more of a kind of a rain pattern as things fall down. So, um, so just things to think about. Uh, stream straighteners do help with smooth bore nozzles specifically. Um, we do have the stack tips on the engine. Uh, those are meant to go on the, um, on the deck gun should we ever need them. Uh, automatic nozzles work great as a deck gun option because your flow can vary and your automatic nozzle will compensate. That's one of the reasons they're so popular on deck guns. Uh, my understanding um, is that that's one of the reasons they first got adopted in the fire service uh, was, you know, engines used to have two and a half inch supplies. And so if you had a deck gun flying on an, or, a, or an aerial flying um, flowing water, uh, they would bring in a two and a half inch line and they would throw a Siamese on it and then they would flow as much water as they could. And then when they got another water supply, they'd throw, hook another two and a half on it and flow as much water as they could and then get another one. And the automatic nozzle adjusts on that. So that's a great advantage to using an automatic nozzle on a deck gun or an aerial device because your flow can change and your stream still stays good. So uh, if you have a smooth bore on there, then you really have to match your flow uh, and to your pressure in order to get a good stream whether it's on an aerial or, a, um, or an engine. So that's one of the reasons we have automatic nozzles on our engines. Uh, as far as the deck guns, uh, they're a great tool we can use there. 
uh, but we do have an ISO requirement of having those stack tips. Uh, if you are ever flowing a stack tip um, <clears throat> on a master stream, do remember to use the stream straightener. straightener. It makes a significant effect. Um, Hal's got a story where uh, he was at a fire um, in Cheyenne and they were not reaching the target, not reaching the target. They threw a stream straightener on there and even when the engine was at idle, they were all of a sudden reaching the target. So they do help. And what they do is create a laminar flow before the um, of water before the uh, the water hits the nozzle itself. So they are effective. And we saw that in our own flow test. When you compare um, a stream straightener to a non-stream straightener, we did have a little bit more of an effect here. You know, 20 feet, but sometimes that can be all the difference, especially when you're looking at an application where, um, you know, you're really shooting up water a long ways. So automatic nozzles are what we primarily use. Um, I really focus on the word relatively constant nozzle pressure. So automatic nozzles, technically provide a constant nozzle pressure across a design flow range, uh, but I really like to include this word relatively in there because that, that nozzle pressure does change as we'll get into here in a little bit. So where do we have these? We have them in lots of places. We have them on our, blit, our blitz fire, our deck gun, and then just as a reminder, we removed the two and a half fogs uh, several years ago after the flow testing. Reason being, uh, for the same flow, when compared to a smooth bore, you have a massive nozzle reaction increase. Um, I think it's, I'm, I'm sorry, this is off the top of my head, I might be a little bit wrong, but it's in the, the 120 to 130 pound uh, nozzle reaction for a 250 ppm fog nozzle at 100 PSI, where we achieve that same flow at 99 pounds um, on our current two and a half. So uh, it's pretty obvious. We don't have a lot of, of, of benefit from those. So those have been removed. They're not on the engines anymore. Our main tools are TFT mid-force dual pressure nozzle. Uh, we see these on our bumper lines. Um, and on our standard inch and three quarter attack lines. And we're all familiar with these. Uh, remember, they're a relatively constant nozzle pressure across a designed flow range. So every automatic nozzle is gonna have a different design flow range. Um, ours are 70 to 200. So that means between 70 and 200 GPM, you should get a pretty good looking stream, a pretty good reaching stream out of it. Your flow is gonna vary, but that's its design flow range. Now that's kind of the max and minimum design flow range. This has a wheelhouse of that like, 150 to 180 GPM is really where this nozzle performs the best. And we'll see that here in a minute when we look at a chart. Remember, this is a dual pressure nozzle. We use them exclusively in the low pressure setting, um, <clears throat> almost exclusively 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, but they do have a 100 pound option, which we're also gonna talk about. Uh, just remember that we do have the breakaway or the high rise version of this. Uh, we have this portion of the nozzle in our high rise bag that we can use for ventilation. Um, but uh, remember, we don't want to hook that up to the standpipe as uh, a primary attack line. Uh, just kind of some interesting trivia from back in the day. We used to have the, the ball valve on the front of this, which has a slide valve inside with that little twist on and off, which is another thing to remember if you're operating these at a, at a high-rise event for hydraulic ventilation, you do have that on and off, uh, that, that twist lock I think is easily forgotten about. But when we did flow testing, we found the nozzle pressure on this nozzle did not equal the nozzle pressure on this nozzle because essentially this ball valve acted as an appliance and added 10 pounds. So we found that during our, our flow testing, which was kind of interesting. Little tidbit, not too relevant today, but I'm about tidbits and I'm a talker, so. So moving on with automatic nozzles and how they work, um, this is kind of a cutaway of an automatic nozzle. So here we have water coming in the nozzle uh, through the coupling and then to the slide valve, which is how these nozzles operate. These slide valves are, are a good tool, which we'll talk about here in a second. And then here's the automatic control mechanism, which is basically a spring. So if we blow this up, uh, water comes past this spring, which is typically enclosed, and it hits this baffle. And then as water pressure increases, the, it, the spring allows that baffle to get further and further out, which increases the distance between this nozzle, the stream shaper and the baffle, which increases the orifice size, which increases your flow. So this spring is automatically regulating your uh, nozzle pressure. So here we see an example of that. Uh, we have a 100 PSI nozzle. Uh, we see we're staying at 100 PSI at each one of these flows, and we're going from 100 to 200 to 300 GPM. And I don't know how well this shows up on the video, but we see our baffle and our stream shaper has a small gap at 100 GPM, a larger gap at 200 GPM, and then its largest gap at 300 GPM. So that's what's happening. That baffle is coming further and further out, increasing this orifice, uh, which is doing a couple things. Increasing the orifice is increasing our flow, but this spring tension is maintaining our nozzle pressure, which is what makes it automatic. <clears throat> so standard versus low pressure. 
We have two settings on these nozzles. Uh, we have a 55 pound setting and a 100 pound setting. Uh, obviously red and blue, everyone knows that. So um, how does this work though? It works with what's called hydraulic assist. So, <coughs> excuse me. So this picture we just looked at a second ago, um, where the water hits this baffle, this is that mechanism just enclosed, right? And here's the baffle. So uh, this little hole here that looks almost like a, like a blip on the screen, um, when you're in low pressure, the water comes past this, goes through this hole, and then out this little hole at the front. There's two of them here and here. And uh, so this thing fills with water, that water passes right through the nozzle and doesn't do anything to the spring. In standard pressure, when you flip that, you can see that that hole is covered. So these holes are open, these are, these are uh, I'm sorry, these holes are open, these are covered, and it builds up pressure within here, and then that's the hydraulic assist. That built up pressure switches it from a 100 pound, no a 55 pound nozzle to a 100 pound nozzle. Uh, before I knew this, I was always like, man, how, how when you turn that switch, if you're taking 45 pounds away, are you just not having to like crank down on it? And that's why, because it uses hydraulic assist to do that. So remember, automatic nozzles have a relatively constant nozzle pressure. So this is TFT's chart for our mid-force nozzles. Uh, we basically have flow increasing here and pressure increasing here. And here's that wheelhouse. Here's that design flow range from 70 to 200 GPM. Um, and we see in standard pressure, as flow increases, right, our GPM goes up, our nozzle pressure goes up as well. And the same thing happens in standard pressure. But as you can see, within this design flow range, uh, we have a variance, right? We do have this curve to account for. So when you read an ISTA book, you say, oh, a nozzle reaction or a nozzle pressure is 100 PSI. Well, that's not true because nozzle, nozzle reaction is going to be 100 PSI at 110, P, 110 GPM. Anywhere outside of that, you're going to vary. So when you flow test these nozzles, they're allowed to work within a 15 PSI variance in either direction for NFPA standards. Um, and that's why, because they have to have this, this wheelhouse to change. So like, um, another thing that'll kind of happen with automatic nozzles is as they reach their peak flow, they'll actually dip a little bit in nozzle pressure, um, which is kind of interesting. I don't know why that happens. So here we see low pressure. Once again, it creeps up as we go up and we'll see we're at 180 GPM. We're at 60 PSI, which is right what our charts say, 55, 60 PSI. So this chart is right on for what our, uh, not, our flow test uh, showed. So an interesting thing happens here. Um, so whether we're in standard or low pressure, um, at a certain point, these two pressures marry and then they go up exponentially together. And I'll give you a minute to kind of think about why that might be. So what's happening at this point right here is that spring is maxed out and it, it can't create a bigger orifice. So at that point, um, any increase in pressure is going, it, it negates the dual pressure function of the nozzle. Uh, the, the spring is maxed out, the orifice is maxed out, uh, it's no longer a dual pressure nozzle. But it's outside the design flow range, we don't really use it there, but that will be important when we look at the blitz fire here in a minute, so I'll kind of come back to that. <clears throat> so that's why we get our nozzle pressure from the charts, because the nozzle pressure varies. Uh, this little video here is a great example of um, how exactly this works. Brass cats and harsh backs of automatic nozzles. Here we are with the automatic nozzle. We're doing a comparison of what the automatic nozzle is designed to do. Regardless of the pressure provided from the pumper to the nozzle, it's going to give you a constant good stream, but at three different flows. Here, one of them flowing at 75 gallons a minute, still a good stream. We up the pressure, we get 125 gallons a minute, still a, a good looking stream, not a lot of difference in how the stream itself looks. Then we pump it up to 150 GPM, still same looking stream, but three different flows. The automatic nozzle is designed to always give us a constant good looking stream, but not the guaranteed flow. Flow comes from the pressure that the, the pumper is gonna provide to the nozzle. Next, you see here we're flowing a two and a half at 150, 200, and 250. You can see all three have a good looking, good reaching stream, but three different flows. That's what an automatic nozzle is designed to do. 
Once again, the RPMs of the bumper itself has got to provide the pressure to compress that spring to give you the flows. Automatics are designed to give a constant stream over a variable flow based on the pressure provided to the nozzle. So he does a good job of being very intentional about his verbiage with that. He says a good, a good looking, a good reaching stream. Um, and that's very intentional when people talk about nozzles, myself included. Uh, remember, you're not going to like, and that's one of the disadvantages of an automatic nozzle because your stream might look great, but you might not have the GPM behind it to combat uh, BTU. So we'll talk about some of these pros and cons later, but um, it's imp that's important verbiage uh, to say it's not just a, a good stream. It's a good looking stream. It's a good reaching stream. But, you know, if something's happened, you've lost pressure at the pump, you have a couple kinks in the line, you no longer have, you're kind of taking the bullets out of your gun and your stream is still going to look good. It's going to reach well, but it might not have the, the right GPM to combat the VTU you're after. So that's a reason there are certain people who say automatic nozzles have no business within a structure. Um, I think that's a bit more complicated than that. And I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a bit. Uh, so once again, uh, you know, we have the TFT chart, but we had to prove this to ourselves and we did a bunch of pressure tests and we did see some variance in uh, nozzle pressure across different flows, but we landed on an average, right? Which is where we landed now. So we have our averages um, uh, for a car fire. We're down, it's the number is not on here. I think it's 45 PSI at the nozzle uh, off the top of my head. And then um, here's our target fire flow of 180 GPM, uh, 55 pounds at the nozzle. Nozzle reaction is 67, which is underneath that 70, which is our target. Um, and that's what we're after. So it's important to use the nozzle pressure uh, numbers off the charts. And, uh, and it's important to remember that they can fluctuate on this chart. Sorry for the bad picture, I had a hard time building this. Um, remember, we have a car fire where our nozzle pressure is down at 45, and then we have our uh, structure fire, which is pumped at 60 PSI at the nozzle. Uh, our smooth bores are typically charged at, uh, pumped at 50 PSI at the nozzle. Where that changes is our high rise, which is that 45 PSI at the nozzle, where we're under pumping that a little bit uh, so that our, um, our target uh, fire flow comes down a little bit to match the standpipe. So that'll be pumped at 45. Remember with the blitz fire, we actually have 110 PSI um, for a nozzle pressure. That's for a couple reasons. Uh, I think it's the next slide. If it's not, nope, let's talk about it now. So um, there's friction loss within the blitz fire. Uh, and we've already accounted for that with this 110 PSI. So we don't have an appliance loss for the friction loss itself. Um, additionally, uh, we've pumped the blitz fire at that max GPM, that 500 GPM. Um, that'll come up better on the slide in a second, but that's where we see those uh, low and standard pressure targets or fire uh, pressures marry and go up together. So since that's where we pump it and you can control it at the nozzle, whether you're in standard or low pressure doesn't matter that much. And that's kind of where this 100 PSI comes from versus like the, uh, the 55 PSI that it could be if you, when we manipulate it in low pressure. But because of the way we use it, um, we operate at 110 PSI at the nozzle. I don't think I did a great job explaining that, but hopefully you get the point. So in looking at the difference between standard or low pressure, uh, there's a few things to consider. Um, this was kind of the slide we used uh, back in 2016 during the major emphasis training to really try to convince the department to go to, to, go to low pressure. Um, so we'll just kind of review that, talk about the differences in standard or low pressure. I know we're standard across the board in low pressure, uh, but we'll just talk through a few things. So um, the biggest effect switching from standard to low pressure is nozzle reactions. So once we have our target fire flow of 180 GPM uh, in low pressure, we can achieve that uh, with 67 pounds of nozzle reaction, which is great. It's under that 70 pounds that we want to maintain. Um, and that takes a one firefighter line, uh, which is great. Just by switching to low pressure, uh, we'd have to increase our pump discharge pressure uh, to or our total line pressure to get uh, the same flow. Uh, so we'd be at 100 pounds of the nozzle, and now we have 90 pounds of nozzle reaction versus 67, which is substantial. We've essentially, for the same flow, we've taken a three fire, uh, one firefighter line and turned it into an almost three firefighter line. So um, that's substantial. So we need to really critically think about um, what other effects do we have that could possibly make us still want to use standard pressure. So um, it almost seems too good to be true. So why, use low, why not use low pressure? So the first effect is droplet size. Uh, in standard pressure, we do have a smaller droplet, uh, but we have to remember um, how we apply water is in a straight stream, right? So if we're in a straight stream uh, in standard pressure, or a straight stream in lower pressure, it's true in standard pressure, we're gonna have a smaller droplet of water, but not that much smaller, and it's not gonna have that much of an effect because we're operating the nozzle in straight stream. 
And if I open the nozzle in this room, it's immediately hitting the walls and the chairs and the ceiling and the counter and, the, and all that stuff. So it's immediately breaking apart anyway. So in a straight stream application, droplet size doesn't have as big an effect. Um, it's more when you go to that fog application that you want that really small droplet of water where you're specifically gas cooling for specific reasons on specific flows and all that kind of thing. So uh, in a straight stream application, uh, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Uh, we see where we really see it uh, is, is the nozzle reaction, like I was saying, and we do lose velocity because we're going from 100 PSI to uh, 60 pounds at the nozzle. So we are taking uh, some of the powder out of our bullet, right? We're losing that velocity. So it makes sense that we lose reach. But when we did our reach uh, studies, we only lost like a 5% reach, uh, which really wasn't that much. We also saw a tighter grouping of our reach. So this is standard pressure, you know, reach. And remember, this is where it's raining down at 100 and, you know, 30 plus feet out. But uh, we saw a bit of a tighter grouping in lower pressure uh, due to that uh, larger drop of the water, keeping that water stream a little bit together. So we do have a little bit of a tighter grouping in low pressure, which is, uh, which is kind of a nice thing for, for reach, more effective at distance. Um, where it really comes down to is our nozzle reaction, which comes down to staffing. Um, you know, we have one firefighter on, the, on most hand lines and uh, help is sporadic and that's okay. Nobody's doing anything wrong. Um, you know, the captain is paying attention to radio traffic, looking at the tick, uh, going back to get more hose. So it's very often uh, in our deployment model that the firefighter is going to be alone on the nozzle. Like I said, that's fine. That's okay. We just need to adjust our, our deployment model and our, and our nozzle reaction to be manageable for one firefighter. So we just need to be realistic about what we're doing uh, and, and try to shoot for that 70 pounds of nozzle reaction, which is what we can achieve in low pressure. So there really isn't that much we can gain in a straight stream high GPM fire attack uh, when you look at standard uh, and low pressure. Um, we also just need a standard, right? We all, I'm sure not everyone, but a lot of us remember uh, back in the day when you pumped a DO problem and you know, you, okay, Cap, what you got for me? Uh, give me a 200 foot line, uh, standard or low pressure? Uh, standard, uh, what GPM? You know, so now we've got a standard. It's always low pressure. It's always 180 GPM for a structure fire. So that's nice as well. Uh, this is just a reminder that uh, inside of these nozzles, we have a slide valve, which allows us to get back uh, very effectively. This is a TSP uh, patent. Uh, water comes in and instead of a ball valve, which creates a lot of turbulence, um, the seat for this little round part slides forward and back, uh, opening and closing this nozzle, um, which is a great tool. It's hard to get back a smooth bore and be effective. Um, you know, if you're mopping up or, you know, you're putting out a couple hot spots in a basement and you've got a little small uh, observation hole you're trying to aim for and you got a smooth bore nozzle and you open that up, it's going to spray everywhere. So uh, we can gate back just a very little bit, still in a straight stream and get water exactly where we want it. Uh, same thing if we have, you know, a dumpster fire and I want to, um, you know, I'm holding the nozzle way above my head. And even though we pump those at a little bit less GPM, uh, it's nice to have that control at the nozzle. So uh, I don't, you know, get my butt kicked with the nozzle way over my head. So is getting back a good thing? Uh, I'd say if you're trying to affect change on flashover, that's not the time to get back, right? That's when we want our full design flow, which is a targeted fire flow to combat flashover. Um, but there's a lot of situations where gating back uh, can really help. You know, car fires, dumpster fires, even on a structure fire in certain situations, uh, if you don't need the flow uh, that you're, the full flow that you're getting with a fully open valve. Um, those clicks on the TFT nozzle are kind of an interesting story. They relate back to the uh, Iowa formula um, back in the day uh, with the Lloyd Lehman studies when they developed these nozzles. It was meant to know exactly what your flow was at each click because the Iowa formula gives you a, a total gallonage application for a room, not gallons per minute, but let's say I'm in, you know, I'm in the classroom at station 10 right now. And uh, let's say I needed 20 total gallons uh, over a 30 second application on a fog stream. I would go to the click where I knew it was 40 gallons a minute on a 30 degree fog, fog out this room. Um, and that was kind of that application. That's where those clicks come from. Just a little bit of history going back to, uh, you know, the, the late fifties, early sixties, kind of an interesting little tidbit there that you guys probably don't care about, but whatever. So uh, moving on to another automatic nozzle, we have the Blitzfire. I was talking about this a little bit earlier. We do have standard and low pressure on this nozzle as well, uh, but we operate this at 500 GPM. So we're looking at the same kind of chart we were looking at there earlier, um, where we have pressure going up and GPM going up. And we have low pressure and standard pressure, but we just always run this at a 500 GPM. So we're always at that point where, uh, where they marry together and go up. So it doesn't really matter if it's in standard or low pressure. 
Um, I typically keep uh, the engine I'm driving on low pressure just to keep things the same across the board. But the nice thing about that automatic nozzle is you don't need to use that full 500 GPM if you don't need it. So if you set it up for exposure protection or you're cooling a tank or whatever you're doing, we can use that automatic nozzle to really adjust our flow so we're not just wasting a ton of water overusing or creating runoff problems or all that kind of stuff. Um, we didn't see a big difference uh, between standard or low pressure on our flow tests because that 500 GPM, it's essentially the same, the same nozzle because that orifice is uh, all the way open because that spring is, is maxed out in between the baffle and the stream scraper, stream straightener, stream shaper, excuse me. Uh, we operate these at 500 GPM, but just remember these things have that automatic shutoff. So we don't really have monitors that we can set up. We have very few left in the system that are like true street sets. So if you're setting this up, as some sort of remote exposure protection or remote cooling of a tank or something like that. Just remember, to, this is something where you might want to tie back that nozzle so you can control it at the, um, or the bale, so you can control it at the engine. Um, nozzle maintenance, uh, just some stuff to wrap up on nozzles. We sent all of our nozzles back to TFT in 2017 and 18, and we're not doing any more of those field services, uh, which I think crews were doing that before, where you kind of squirt that oil down in the nozzle and let it uh, lubricate the parts. We, we don't need to do that. Uh, per TFT, as long as they're passing uh, their nozzle tests, which we do every year, uh, then we don't need to do that. If we need to service the nozzle, we'll send it back to TFT. We've got lots of spares in the warehouse. If you ever got a problem with those, uh, uh, with those dual uh, pressure nozzles, uh, we got plenty, so just uh, get one from the warehouse. Uh, we do do annual uh, hose and nozzle flow tests. Um, less so with hose, I kind of just kind of keep an eye on those as I train throughout the year and just make sure that our friction loss characteristics stay the same. I know there's some other crews out there that do the same thing. Our nozzles, we do test when we do pump testing and uh, we're coming, uh, we use the NFPA standard to test those. So uh, we're making sure that they're functioning correctly because that is a problem with automatic nozzles is that they do require maintenance and you do need to keep an eye on them because if they freeze up and gum up, then uh, they, they will have issues. Um, this is also kind of up to you. Uh, the, I mean, we know our flows, we know our friction loss, we know our nozzle pressures, we know what we should be getting. So uh, as you're all out and about training, you know, pay attention to those flow meters and pay attention to those gauges, those pressure gauges, and, and uh, you know, just make sure that you're getting about that 180 GPM uh, and you're getting right, getting right about that 130 PSI. It's important that everyone in the system kind of pays attention to those numbers so we know if things are getting away from us. Uh, most likely though, if you do in the field notice that your gallon edge is off, uh, I would bet that it's probably your flow meter. We're definitely gonna wanna check that. You know, like if you're noticing a problem, we're gonna wanna like compare it against a calibrated flow meter, but your flow meter might've gotten away from you on your engine. That's a, that, that can happen. All those, those should get calibrated every year during nozzle testing or uh, pump testing. So every nozzle has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, we have smooth bore versus automatic. So a smooth bore nozzle is tough and simple. There's no doubt about it. There's almost nothing that can go wrong with that thing. Automatic nozzles require maintenance. They require that we keep up on them and we do. So we're checking that box. Smooth bore has a known flow and a known PSI. Uh, automatic nozzle only has a known flow with flow tests. With auto automatic fog nozzle, the only way you know your flow is with a flow meter. Luckily, we've done extensive flow testing. We do know what those numbers are. Um, so we're kind of checking that box. Uh, smooth bores, uh, they kink bore, they just do. Automatic nozzles have a higher back pressure, which allows us to uh, operate with less kinks, which is a great benefit. Um, with a smooth bore nozzle, we kind of already talked about this, a loss of pressure equals a loss of stream quality. Uh, that's either a pro or a con, depending on how you look at it. And then an automatic nozzle, um, loss of pressure equals good stream quality in the sense that you have good reach and uh, you, have a, you have a stream that's intact making it to its destination. The danger with that is that you might have lost your flow due to a kink or, or whatever, a pump problem or a DO miscalculation. Uh, you might not have the GPM that you think you have and the stream's not gonna tell you that. So uh, that can be a disadvantage. So our kind of workaround with that is, is training on the correct nozzle reaction, you know? So when we're on those nozzles and we're holding them, we should kind of feel what they feel like in different situations and kind of just have that muscle memory for, for you know, if, if you're, if you're 30, 40 GPM under that 180 target fire flow, you're gonna feel that. Um, when we bring new uh, recruits online, I do a class with them in the post academy where I throw a couple kinks in the line behind them and it's amazing. They'll go from bracing with that nozzle to like, whoa, like they can really feel it. So that's something you can do next time you're training, kind of just feel those different flows, throw a couple kinks in there. And I think you'll be surprised at how much of a difference uh, you can actually feel. Now, you get into structure fire, your adrenaline's pumping a little bit. Um, you know, you might not notice that as much. So that's why it's super important that we don't get any kinks. It's super important that the DO dials in a good pressure because unless something 
completely out of our control happens, we should be where we're at if we have good hose deployment, no kinks, that kind of stuff. Um, a big benefit we get out of automatic nozzles is the use of foam. Um, we're not gonna get uh, very effective foam out of a smooth bore, and foam helps us on car fires, on structure fires, on just about every fire that we have. So, um, so that's another advantage to automatic nozzles. Um, there are there is some talk out there about automatic nozzles uh, failing and when automatic nozzle not necessarily failing not providing the flow that you think you're getting and that is very often from departments who haven't conducted extensive flow testing like we have so that's not as much of a problem as other departments have um, Dennis Segear uh, who's a big um, hose and nozzle guy uh, we took a class from him a couple years ago and I've been following him for a long time and and he's never really been a proponent of fog or or um, or smoothbore. He's always said, "I'm pro, uh, I'm pro knowledge. I'm not pro tool." Right? They're each tools. They have pros and cons. And a class I took from him a year or two ago was the first time I really started he hearing him recommend smoothbore. And we had a conversation around that. I was like, "Man, Dennis, I've never heard you like really go towards smoothbore." So we talked about it a little bit, and he basically said, "You know, he's a consultant. His job is to go to different fire departments." And look at their uh, look at their hose and nozzle package, and he, his company's called from hydrants to nozzles. So he's looking at everything from their underground water mains all the way to their nozzles and everything in between. And he's helping departments evaluate what nozzles they have and why. So he's going around the country doing this, and time after time after time after time, he kept going to departments and finding these automatic nozzles uh, in water districts where they had poor water quality or hard water, and um, they flow test them, and they're way way under what they should be. Um, and part of that is due according to him, from just calcification within the nozzle and those things never getting serviced, never getting cleaned. Uh, when I told him that we had almost 20 year old nozzles that had never been maintained and I, told, I showed him the numbers on our flow test performance, he was shocked. He was like, man, I've never seen a municipality where they weren't, uh, their nozzles weren't gummed up after that length of time. Essentially, we got lucky. We've got good water here in Fort Collins, which just doesn't gum up our nozzles. But that also means we uh, we can use automatic nozzles without that big disadvantage. So um, just something to think about. Uh, like, and I personally, once I'm I'm in the camp he's in, I'm not you know pro fog or smooth bore. I'm pro knowledge. Like, know what tool you're using, know the strengths and the weaknesses, know how to use it, um, and know how to overcome deficiencies should they come up. Enough said. So. Uh, <clears throat> Like I mentioned, when you have a fog nozzle, um, we can't, you know, we use a smoothbore nozzle to calibrate a flow meter, uh, and we don't know our flow with a fog nozzle unless, unless we use a flow meter. Uh, we've got one that we've been using uh, for a while. Um, we have a group working on getting a new one. Uh, we'll get some training out when that comes out. Uh, we've got a new flow meter and some new inline pressure gauges. And just as a reminder, there's one on the draft commander too. Um, if you go out and use that thing, um, you can help the people out of Station 8 help you out. You can throw your nozzle on. You can throw your actual hose on. It's got an um, inline pressure gauge for nozzle pressure and a flow meter you can throw in line. And you can, and you can check all your lines and play around with kinking and seeing what that does and all that. So um, another good tool. But we're getting a new flow meter, which is pretty exciting. So continuing backwards from the nozzle, we just spent a lot of time on the nozzle. And we're going to go through friction loss, appliance, and elevation, which is going to be much, much, much shorter. This is just a review. Uh, the bulk of this presentation is nozzles. So uh, friction loss, um, we all know what friction loss is, is hose contacts the edge, or water contacts the edge of the hose, it creates friction, uh, you have laminar flow in the middle, turbulent flow on the outside. The more pressure and water you force through a hose, the more friction loss you get. So uh, an interesting principle, the friction loss principles that I, I get a lot out of is, uh, for the same discharge, friction loss varies inversely as the fifth power of the diameter of the hose. What the hell does that mean? Well, that means that as your hose increases by a factor of one, your friction loss characteristics decrease by a factor of five, which is really, really substantial. Um, I liken that to like when you order a pizza and you get a, a medium to a large, it's only a, a two inch difference, which doesn't seem like all that much, but when you calculate the area of that, it's increased substantially uh, percentage wise. So that's what we're seeing here in real time uh, as we're you know going through a round hose and we're, we're dealing with the same principle. So, um, we, of course, use the number of our charts, and everybody knows that we use those because we flow tested, but just kind of going through the history of how we got here, we used to use the drop 10 method. That was kind of the standard. It worked for a lot of different hose sizes. It was quick and easy. Um, then Captain Albrandt, way back in the day when the hose and nozzle committee um, brought some new TFT nozzles on, they came up with what they called the chuck charts at the time, and uh, they knew about a lot of this back then and came up with the, with the flows that weren't quite as standardized as they are now, but they were kind of getting there. In 2013, uh, Captain Barella um, 
started working on hose loads, brought down all the forward stuff there, started noticing some flow issues. Uh, 2014, Hal and I took over the hydraulics class and we kept finding anomalies and people were starting to ask why. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? And Hal and I didn't have good answers. And that's not a fun place to be. So we're like, man, we need to start doing some flow testing. So we started reading and we started trying to find out these anomalies because basically none of our none of our numbers were matching up with any of the known equations, you know, the drop 10 or the FLCQ squared or any of those formulas weren't working. So uh, we started reading and it wasn't until we finally stumbled across Dennis Laguerre's article, which now is super mainstream. Everybody knows about true diameter hose, but back then it was, it was super hard to find. I mean, you're on like page 16 of a Google search on fire flows and you stumble across Laguerre's article, uh, hose dream um, is where we eventually found out. Anyway, we talked to people, yada, yada, yada. In 2016, we did a bunch of flow testing, came out with a new DO manual, uh, flow tested all of our lines, and that's where our current charts came from. So the bottom line with all this is flow testing is really the only way to truly know your flows. And luckily we've done that and we've got those numbers. So uh, mystery hose, just a reminder that our hose is not true to diameter. So our inch and three quarter is not inch and three quarter. It's more like inch and seven eighths. And it shares those characteristics that would be on an inch and seven eighths hose, right? So we've gone up by a factor of one and our friction loss characteristics have gone down by a factor of five. So that's both good and bad. We're, you know, we could get true diameter hose and have a lighter, a little bit more maneuverable hose, but we're able to irk a little bit more water with a little bit lower friction loss out of this. It doesn't seem to kink very much. It seems to be working pretty well for us. So uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't explore going true diameter or different hose lines or whatever, but uh, you know, when Hal and I were initially doing this all at the beginning, we were out to see, well, man, there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of NIST UL was just getting started on all their flow studies. Water mapping hadn't been done. Flow rates wasn't decided on. We're like, man, it doesn't make sense to make a whole lot of change right now. And in five years, once all this information comes out, um, you know, all of a sudden make wholesale change again. So we decided to make what we had work the best that we could for us. And uh, it's worked out pretty well. And I even with all the change the industry has seen in the last, you know, five or so years, we're still pretty consistent with best practices. You know, 160, 180 target fire flow is a is a fire flow that's still kind of holding water, so to speak, no pun intended, with with all the modern research. Um, you know, fog nozzles are still applicable when used on a straight stream inside of a structure fire in the American Fire Service. So uh, I don't necessarily personally see the need for a wholesale change right now. That doesn't mean we shouldn't and couldn't explore, you know, better options, but what we have is working is what I'm getting at. But we do have mystery hose. It's not true to diameter, and that's why we use the number from the charts. Uh, we conducted our flow test by using an inline flow meter coming into the engine and then using new calibrated pressure gauges at the discharge and the nozzle pressure. Uh, we subtract our nozzle pressure from our total line pressure. That gave us our friction loss, also gave us our nozzle pressure. That's how we got the numbers from the charts. Just remember, the numbers on the charts are averages because they float around a lot. It gave us a ton of data, right? This was all data we had to compile and have to make sense. So just remember that, you know, um, what we have are averages and it's not gonna be uncommon for you to be five PSI or 10, you know, probably not 10, but you know, five or so PFI off, PSI off in either direction based on the hose you have on your specific engine because each, each hose stick to stick is gonna have its own friction loss coefficient. So um, the point with all this is because we're dealing with averages, we're making the best we can uh, out of the equipment that we have. And even if we got brand new hose, we'd still have this issue. Uh, a few pounds does make a difference. So if we're off a couple points because on an average, then the DO doesn't account for an appliance or it doesn't account for a flight of stairs. It can, you know, we end up those little bits here and there, that two PSI here, the three PSI there, the five PSI here. Before you know it, you're 10, 15 PSI off and now you've got a problem. So let's talk about that. Um, so if we have 300 feet, two and a half with an inch and an eighth tip, and this isn't some you know crazy hydraulic calculation we're never gonna do. This is our two and a half pre-connect, right? So 200 feet at two and a half with an inch and an eighth tip. So if we, uh, 50 pounds at the nozzle and we keep that as a constant, if I were to do the old school method and do drop 10, I'd take away uh, the last number, which leaves me with 26. I'd take 10 away from that. Leaves me 16 pounds nozzle reaction or uh, friction loss per section. So we plug those in. Gives us 48 pounds of uh, friction loss, plus our nozzle reaction means we pump this line at 98 pounds. Well, if we look at our chart, we we're actually at 11 on this line instead of 16, and you're like, well, it's only five pounds off. That doesn't make that big a difference. Well, let's take a look at that. So if we plug 11 in here instead of 16, that takes us from 48 to 33. <clears throat> we'd pump this, instead of 98, we'd pump this at 83. Well, that's a 15 PSI difference, which is pretty substantial. 
But I do hear once in a while from DOs, oh, it's only a few pounds, it doesn't make a big, big difference. Well, let's examine that. Where does that 15 PSI, that extra pound, that extra um, pressure go if we don't uh, account, like if we use an old school hydraulic method and set up our numbers off our charts, where does that go? Well, it goes directly into the nozzle. So it increases our nozzle reaction from 50 to 65 PSI, and then that increases our flow out of that nozzle as well. Um, so if we examine what that actually does, an inch and eighth tip at 50 PSI flows at 266 GPM with 99 pounds of nozzle reaction, a three firefighter line. That's right where we want to be for three firefighters. Uh, then if we throw that same line, the inch and eighth tip at 65 PSI, we're going to go from 266 GPM to 303 GPM from 90, 90 pounds of nozzle reaction to 130. Remember, like I said, everything about over 100 is starting to really break away from a, a hand line. So we're going, I mean, that's, almost a third more nozzle reaction, which is, which is very substantial, just from what seem, a seemingly insignificant 15 PSI difference in the line. So we're really striving for accuracy as DOs, which is what we're trying to drive home with all this. Accuracy matters. We're gonna be off a couple points because the, the numbers we have on our charts are an average. We don't wanna be off a couple points anywhere else in our equation, and we wanna be accurate. So we wanna charge those lines, make sure that needle's right where it needs to be on the gauge, You know, double check on your pump table that you've accounted for elevation, for um, for appliances, uh, make sure all your calculations are correct. So that's why we use the charts. We use the numbers on the charts. Uh, remember, they're an average, uh, and accuracy does count. So uh, part of that is watering the grass, which is um, flowing, getting a nice flowing pressure. So just kind of talking through what that looks like. Let's say my target PSI was 130 PSI for, for a normal inch and three quarter, 200 foot attack line. So I flow water, uh, I get that that set. When the firefighter shuts the nozzle down, what does this needle do? It spikes, right? Because all that stored pressure, that hose expands out, it, exp it expands lengthwise, it expands in diameter, and then it all squeezes back down on that hose and we see a spike. Let's say it spikes to 150, I see that all the time. Now the driver who didn't set a flowing pressure freaks out. They're like, they look at their needle and they're like, oh shoot, I'm at 150 and I should be at 130. So what's their initial response? They either gate back or they throttle back on the engine. Then the firefighter opens the line and now all of a sudden they're down to 100 because they've messed with what should have been a sure thing. So now they have to play catch up. So uh, this is much, this is uh, exacerbated putting a second line into service of lower pressure. So let's say we put uh, an initial line of, uh, in at 130 and then we put, an inch, we put a two and a half in service at like 72 PSI, right? Well, <clears throat> when I charge that 72 PSI line, it's going to immediately jump to whatever my highest line is because I'm not flowing water. It's not until they start flowing water that I can start dialing that pressure in. So the whole point of watering the grass is to know that the DO set a flowing pressure. So you charge that first line, they either water the grass or reset the fire, and you just watch that gauge and make sure it stays at that target 130, then you know it's good to go. You don't have to mess with it anymore. So if you look at it, your gauge again, and it's at 150, you're like, oh, I know what happened. He shut the line down. So we want to make watering the grass part of our culture and train on it. And that's the DO and the firefighter working as a team. And both of them know that that's coming. Uh, and in that class that I teach with the recruits when they first come out of the academy, uh, we definitely talk about that. So, so we're trying to keep that culture built. Um, Couple final points on friction loss. Uh, we do have a problem with our two and a half. Our friction loss variants were, were pretty wild per our flow testing, per our flow testing. Um, anywhere, you know, we'd, we'd flow a, a two and a half uh, at 250 GPM and we'd see friction loss variants of, you know, on a 100 foot stick of five or 10 PSI, sometimes as high as 15. So not ideal. Uh, we kind of, the two and a half we have has just kind of been the cheaper hose. Um, it's what we've got and I think it's a problem we need to address and fix. Uh, it's just on the list of a thousand things to do that um, that hasn't gotten done yet. So one of these days we'll take care of it uh, and we'll deal with it. High rise have the same problem until we fix that with the two inch. So uh, if anybody wants to tackle that problem, um, I'm happy to provide some input. Um, so continuing back from the no nozzle, we've talked about nozzles, friction loss. Let's talk just a little bit about appliances. Uh, remember we lose 10 PSI friction loss per appliance. That's gonna be a Y, a Siamese, a reducer. Uh, we lose 25 PSI for a street set. But like I said earlier, that's not a blitz fire. That's taking the, the deck gun off the top of the engine, you know, make, turning it into a street set with the attachment uh, and using it as, as such. That would have, you know, then we would be our nozzle pressure and then we'd have an appliance of 25 right there.
So not the case for our Blitzfire, and very few engines anymore have that detachable um, deck gun. So the uh, the 110 psi nozzle pressure on the Blitzfire already has the um, friction loss for the device already set in, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, talking a little bit about Ys, uh, hydraulics is supplied to Y. I know this is going to be a review for a lot of people, um, but we do have a hydraulic problem when we run a supply to Y. So let's talk through that a little bit. So if we have uh, 300 feet of three inch going to a 200 foot inch and three quarter pre-connect at 180 BPM, uh, we'd lose three PSI per 100 feet in our three inch. So we plug that in, we lose nine PSI, right? So now we put another line in service. Naturally, our flow goes up from 180 to 360. Now our friction loss goes to eight PSI, and now we have 24 instead of nine. When this line, which is once again a 15 PSI difference. So when you shut this line down, where does that 15 PSI go? Yep, it goes into this nozzle, which uh, or increases the nozzle pressure here, which increases the flow, increases the pressure, and increases the nozzle reaction. So we have this hydraulic problem with the Y, so we have very specific Y rules at PFA. Um, this is a video, I'm not gonna play it for you right now. Uh, you can click it out on the PowerPoint if you want. It kind of shows the hydraulic effect with some uh, pressure gauges and whatnot. So um, we flow tested this. We're like, man, is this something that, that um, that we can mitigate is this something safe we can do based on uh, what, what our equipment does so this is a two and a half versus a three inch uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute but uh, the two and a half uh, we have this two and a half exacerbates this problem because we have more friction loss in the two and a half than we do a three inch so the total line pressure for this is going to be higher which makes this problem worse so when we did this with the two and a half and we shut it down we went from uh, shut down one line we went from 180 ppm to 250 ppm and a nozzle reaction that went from um, 67 to 94, which if you remember is about a, a two and a half with an inch and eighth tip. It's only five pounds less than that. If you're just standing there operating a nozzle, uh, the other line gets shut down and all of a sudden you're slammed with an extra um, substantial amount of nozzle reaction. So we can mitigate that. We can take about 10 pounds off that nozzle reaction if we switch that two and a half out uh, to three inch, brings our total line pressure down a little bit, which helps mitigate some of this, but we still have an issue with this but supply to Ys are advantageous. We can use them in a lot of places, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. One thing we definitely don't wanna do is create some sort of manifold. So like, you know, we, we removed those large Ys off the engines after the flow testing for this reason. We don't wanna create some big manifold because it, it, it exponentially increases this hydraulic effect. Um, we tried to flow test this, but our flow meter at the time would only really be accurate up to about 500 GPM and this just became unruly. The highest we could get was about 245 GPM with a nozzle reaction of 122, but we weren't even flowing the right amount of water for this. It would have been, this is a dangerous situation. It's still technically, like you're physically capable of putting together enough adapters and contraptions off an engine or two to make this happen, but we don't wanna do this. This is an unsafe operation. Plus the gold standard is to pull an extended attack line if, that's, if, uh, um, if at all available. So um, there's a lot of people who advocate that Ys have no business in the fire ground. We have the pressure spike issue, and then another issue they talk about is that one supply line feeds both of your attack lines. Um, but when you think about how we use supply to Y, um, our, our supplies to our Ys, our three inch, are, ver are very, or I mean almost always in a non-IDLH environment. So and they're also operating a pressure well under our test pressure for our hose. So we shouldn't expect a failure of that line. Um, so that's something we're kind of mitigating. We do have a pressure spike uh, issue to deal with, but we have to look at PFA. We've got a lot of old town alleys, prairie mansions out east, oddly configured apartments. A lot of situations where a supply to Y will be quicker and easier than extending an inch and three quarter, which is obviously the best option because then our governor can mitigate any sort of spikes. Um, so we have specific Y rules at PFA. Uh, we use three inch uh, to supply a Y. We don't use two and a half. Uh, that includes a blitz fire. The blitz fire is designed to be used uh, with three inch and that's what our charts are for. It's also what our hose deployment is designed for. Um, things that are not allowed on the end of the wire are dual Ys. So that's that Y manifold, big water hand lines. So you can't put like two, two and a halfs off of a Y and lines with different pressures. So you couldn't hook up a uh, hundred feet on one side and 200 feet on the other side of a Y cause that's a different pressure. So we don't want to do that. Uh, we can't gate back at the Y. I know that's something we always used to talk about with older school hydraulics, you know, oh, we'll just gate back at the Y, but you know, what, what gauge are you using? What happens when you shut the nozzle off and the whole hose spins over and like, it's just, it's not practical. It's not realistic. It's not something we can really do. So that's not an option. 
To simply put, per our OD, we use three inch to supply the wire with a maximum of two inch and three quarter hoses of equal length attached to the Y. We call it a supply to Y. We used to call this all sorts of stuff, an alley lay, a rural lay, all sorts of stuff, but now it's just supply to Y. Engine whatever is pulling a supply to Y to the Charlie side, everyone knows what that means. Then we have to use some learned sense with that, right? So that means if we are running a supply to Y, the back, we need a little bit more backup from the captain because we are dealing with uh, increased nozzle reaction. So that captain's gotta be a bit heads up. Um, slippery conditions, getting up on a roof, getting up on a rat ladder, maybe you wanna consider extending that. That's probably not the best time to be using a supply to Y. Um, just some things to think about. We also need to consider bringing our hose line uh, with us up to the uh, up to the fire uh, if we're second, third in, which is something I think we're, we're definitely getting in the practice of doing. So continuing backwards from the nozzle, we talked about nozzle pressure, friction loss, appliance. Let's talk a little bit about elevation. We'll move on to some pump operations and we'll be done. So um, elevation, uh, we have to overcome elevation because of head pressure. So uh, for every, if you stack water vertically and put a pressure gauge on the bottom, uh, you'll have the gravity of the water pressing down on that pressure gauge and you'll end up with a, with a number at the bottom for an increased pressure, right? That's why when you go down in water, you feel that pressure uh, if you're diving or snorkeling or whatever, right? So uh, that turns out to be 0 0.434 PSI per foot if you stack water vertically. So we round that up and say about a half a PSI per foot. So um, we... If we go up, we have to overcome that. And if we go down, we gain that. So if we go up in elevation, we have to provide extra pressure to overcome that. If we go down in elevation, we have to, um, we have to decrease our pump discharge pressure because we're gonna gain that. So it's real easy because it's 0.5, the math works out great, it's half the height. So if I go up 30 feet, I go 30 divided by two, which is 15, and I'd increase by 15 PSI. If I go down 30 feet, uh, 30 divided by two is 15, and I, and I take away 15 PSI from my pump discharge pressure uh, because I'm gonna gain that as it goes down the hill. If we look at a story in a house, we do story minus one times five. So let's examine why we do that. So if I look at like a two story house, there's 10 feet per story on average, right? 10 times 0.5 is five PSI, so that's five PSI per story. So why is a story minus one? Well, let's look. So if I'm operating on the third story of a structure for, of a fire, I'm uh, sorry, on the third story of a house, I'm not, 30 feet above the ground. I'm operating about 22, 23 feet off the ground, right? So it's story, third story minus one because my nozzle is not on the ceiling of the third floor, it's on the floor of the third floor. So that's story minus one times five. So I have three stories, minus one is two, times five is 10. So this would be 10 PSI for uh, elevation. Uh, remember in high rise, um, we're hooking up with the pressure gauge uh, below the fire floor. Uh, whether that's one or two um, floors below. And if I'm on the sixth floor, I don't need to account, you know, at that pressure gauge for six floors because I'm, I'm controlling the pressure at that gauge. I'm only going up one or two floors. So whatever the gauge is marked uh, for, the, for the right flow, depending on your hose length, on a high rise, the forward DO at the standpipe um, only needs to account for, you know, five or 10 PSI if they're going one or two if the nozzle is one or two PSI above where you're hooking up to the standpipe where your pressure gauge is. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, uh, let me know and I can explain it further. Uh, so that's pretty much our review of hydraulics. Uh, we just kind of wanted, I know a lot of that was super basic. It was a basic review, but just a refresher to kind of get your head back uh, a little bit into what the DO manual talks about, why we have the, the nozzles we have, why we have the hose loads we do, how the hydraulics work, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so the rest of this, uh, we're gonna kind of fly through uh, we're going to be jumping from topic to topic to topic with no real, um, real like sense of flow. So just bear with me as we just kind of like, like wildly switch gears in between slides here. Uh, so first off, flow rate. Just kind of talking about flow rate, uh, which really is our GPM versus our BTU, right? It's like how much water does it take to put out a fire? Well, why does this matter? We're trying to arrive at or near flashover, and we're trying to control flashover, and we do that in lots of ways. We do that with door control, with direct relates to firefighter safety. NFPA says the first two lines of fire should equal 300 GPM with the second line not being smaller than the first. That's kind of where we get that 150 GPM kind of benchmark. Um, but if that's our minimum and we get a kink in the line or we go up a flight of stairs, now we're already below that minimum, right? So the idea is to walk in with as much water as we can with a manageable amount of nozzle reaction, which leads us to our target fire flow of 180 GPM. And just a reminder of how fast flashover can happen, that's one recliner, which is one megawatt, one couch, which is two megawatts. 
So it can happen very quickly. That's where our target fire flow came from. So before on the old chuck charts, it was anywhere from, you know, 100, excuse me, 100 to 200 uh, GPM and everything in between. But we really have a target. We have that for a reason. This fire flow is, is, is an established fire flow that does some very serious damage on flashover, uh, which is what we're trying to do. So it also happens to be the, the most we can bring into a room with the lowest with a manageable nozzle reaction. So that's where that number comes from. It's not just arbitrarily picked, like it's actually scientifically derived. Um, we've designed the hose line packages on our engines to be simple and effective. And I think back in the day, you know, I remember doing hydraulic problems where you have like, you know, one three inch with three Ys off of it. One's going to a monitor, one's going to a blitz fire, one's going to a hand line, and you're gating back at Ys and you're pumping to the highest pressures. and. And I think that when we go to the pump pit now, it, it's simple and it's not like intentionally meant to dumb down the position of a DO, but we don't need all that complicated stuff. First off, hydraulically, that's an unsafe operation, what I just described. That's not something you could ever do. It's an interesting like, like exercise in hydraulics to demonstrate hydraulic principles, but it's not a practical thing you could actually do on the fire ground. It's actually unsafe to do on the fire ground. So um, what we've done is we've created this hose line package that's simple and effective, right? We have two offensive hand lines. We have our inch and three quarter and our two and a half with an inch and an eighth tip. Screw off that tip, adjust your engine pressure. Uh, and then we go to an inch and a quarter tip, our blitz fire, deck gun, aerial. And then we've also got our high rise option. So that's five lines. If you can pump these five lines with a supply to a Y and a fog nail, that's it. So when you go to the pump pit, and that's why when we're sending out these hydraulic problems, uh, we're, tr like they're, we're, trying, we're trying to make them as complicated as we can within that just to exercise our brains a little bit, but they're really not that complicated anymore. We've got a pretty simple hose line package and it's everything we need. We have two offensive hand lines and we got a kind of a, a hybrid defensive line, a true defensive line in our blitz and then a deck gun. Throw a supply to Y and a, and a fog nail in on that and that's, that's what we need. So it ends up make, making training at the pump pit a little bit, it's hard to be creative. Um, but at the Conix box, we've got a whole list, the Conix box, the DO Conix box at the pump pit. There's a, a notebook in there that's got a bunch of example problems in there with the answers uh, already in there. I've tried to be as creative as we can uh, coming up with those. So I don't know. The whole point of that whole ramble is just that uh, we don't need to do all these complicated things at the pump pit. Get really good at the basics, and that's all we need. Uh, let's talk a little bit about kinks and their actual effect. So. A rule of thumb is that a kink um, in the line uh, has a 10% decrease in flow. Uh, but there's a lot of different type of kinks that you can have in your hose, right? There's that, there's that little just crease you can get. There's a 90 degree kink. It can completely fold back on each other. And they all have different effects. Uh, that 10% is a good rule of thumb, but we wanted to flow test it and find out what we actually had. And we found that one 90 degree kink is a 10% decrease in flow. 180 degree kink was a 20% decrease in flow and two 90 degree kinks was a 30% decrease in flow. Well, that goes back to our target fire flow, right? If we, if, we, if we go up a flight of stairs, we round a corner and we get a kink that we don't know about, there's not a whole lot we can do about that. What we can do is not have kinks in the yard, right? We've planned for, we have an increase of our GPM from that target minimum of 150 GPM to 180. We've got some wiggle room there. But if we walked in the door with that target minimum of 150 and we had a kink unbeknownst to us because of something out of our control, then we're already below the minimum. Our effect on flashover isn't, um, isn't as effective um, and that can create a problem. But we can't allow kinks in the yard. It's just, not, it's just not acceptable. There's no reason for it. We have to manage our kinks. Get hose deployment is the first step. Temporarily increasing pressure can help push those kinks out, but not all the time. Hammering the nozzle can be effective but if you have ever tried that and actually looked at its effect, um, it, it works. If you've got you know, one, two, maybe three relatively small kinks, hammering the nozzle can push those out. Um, you have much more of that, much, many more kinks than that, and, and you don't have the flow and the pressure within the hose to push those kinks out. So next time you're drought training, you know, do a crappy hose deployment. Do, you know, you'll see, you get five, six, seven, eight kinks in there, you hammer the nozzle, it doesn't do anything. It's not moving enough pressure. It's not moving enough water to push those kinks out. So it can be effective to fix some minor mistakes, but not all of them. So the bottom line is that we might have to manually fix kinks. And no one should ever walk past the kink on the fire ground. As a DO, that's one of the first things I look for on a fire with the hose deployment, is just making sure there's no kinks. I mean, that directly ties to firefighter safety. We get a couple kinks in the line. You know, we go from 130 to 140. Now we don't have enough uh, GPM to combat flashover. And that's a big deal. So. Uh, I don't know, take kink seriously, I guess.
completely switching gears again, like I said we were going to do. I just want to remind everybody we see a common mistake on our two and a half pump chart. So this is our two and a half pre-connect. Just remember this little bit up here. People forget about this all the time. We can extend an inch and three quarter uh, with a two and a half and we can use the bail as a reducer. And if that's the case, our flow through our two and a half has gone from our normal 260 ppm to 180 ppm. So there's this little, we, we didn't know where to put that on the chart. This is the only thing that made sense. So if extending an inch and three quarter at 180 ppm with two and a half, allow five PSI per 100. So that's your friction loss at five PSI. So if you ran your two and a half, you ran it uh, to reset a fire, then you unscrewed the tip and you've extended an inch and three quarter, then our friction loss changes from 11 to uh, five PSI. People just forget where that is on the charts. I try to throw them in periodically when we build those, um, the DO problems we do every couple months, just to kind of keep that in your head, but just something to think about. Uh, completely switching gears again, like I said I was going to, uh, fire pumps and standpipes. Uh, fire pumps in our district are designed to give you 500 ppm and 100 psi on the main standpipe at the furthest point. If it's a supplemental standpipe, it's designed to give you 250 ppm and 100 psi at the furthest point. Um, both are supp supplied by the same FDC. So uh, just some things to think about with that. If you look at our two and a half uh, hose build, uh, a 200 foot section is actually pumped at 105. And it's like, well, this says the max we're gonna get is 100. And ideally we wanna let the fire pump do the work so we're not supplementing it. But those furthest discharges are usually in places we're never gonna use. So like the Key Bank building downtown, right? Or any of the buildings downtown, the taller ones, the furthest discharge is on the roof. Like nothing's gonna catch fire on the roof. So if we immediately go a floor below that, now just because of the head pressure there and the way that's designed, we're gonna be at 105 right there. So um, that, that's not always going to work. 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to work off of a standpipe. But there could be situations where we need to boost a little bit of pressure from a fire engine. But by and large, we want to let the fire pump do the work. If they're getting the pressure they need with the fire pump, then the DO just kind of stands there at idle and waits. Um, pressure reducing valves, we don't have any in PFA land, and I'm not going to get into those. Um, they were, yeah, I'm not going to get into them. Uh, we just don't have any, so don't worry about them. So, um, just a reminder, if you're that forward DO, um, we're regulating that pressure in the stairwell uh, as that forward DO in the stairwell. So we put that pressure gauge on, throw the 45 on, the, and then our gauge is marked with how many feet of hose we have out. And then all we have to do is account for elevation above where you are. So like I was saying earlier, if I'm on the fifth floor, they're going to the sixth, I only need to account for one floor of elevation uh, because that's, that's the difference from where my gauge is to where they are. So think of where the gauge is, like that's your engine, right? Like that's your discharge. So if the, if the engine was parked on the fifth floor, you wouldn't have to account for six floors of elevation gain above your engine. Your engine would already be on the fifth floor. That's essentially what's happening. So our procedures uh, as the uh, standpipe DO, we charge it, the FDC at idle, and then we only increase pressure if the crew calls for more pressure. Uh, if you're that forward DO and you have to radio back and forth to dial that pressure in, Man, I would really advise to ask for a different uh, channel so you can go back and forth because that could, that could take a minute to do. And if you're that standpipe DO, remember, you're going to have to overcome that fire pump. So you're going to have to match the fire, depart, the fire pump's pressure, maximum pressure, and then boost it some more. So you might, if they're calling for 10 PSI extra pressure and you don't know what the fire pump's pumping and there's no way of knowing, you're going to have to meet the fire pump pressure and then go 10 PSI above that. So it's going to take a minute to dial that in. So just kind of be aware. We definitely don't want to exceed 200 PSI. That's the design test pressure of those uh, standpipes. Uh, and we do want to remember, in this case, to water the stairwell, uh, which we've done when we've done our high-rise training. That's just that forward DO's chance to dial that pressure back because they don't know what pressure they're going to get. If you're at a 10-story building and they're hooked up on the third floor, they have seven feet of head pressure pushing down on that gauge, you know, plus whatever the fire pump's giving them. So it's, it's, it's a crapshoot with what that gauge is gonna read when they charge that. So we have to give them a, a chance to, uh, to set that pressure. Uh, we talked about the fog nail in there. Um, there is a difference between FDCs and test headers. So there's test headers on the outside of buildings that have a fire pump. And for each uh, discharge that you see, uh, it's about 250 ppm. So if we have a test header on this fire pump on the front of the building, we have one, two, three, four times 250, that'd be a thousand ppm fire pump. The reason I'm mentioning this, it's really easy to hook up to a building, you're accidentally hooking up to the test header thinking that it's an FDC, because not all of them are gonna be four. You might have just two or something like that. You might have three like this. Uh, might not be labeled all that clearly. 
So the bottom line there is if you have male threads coming out of the building, that's the test header. If you have female threads going in, that's the FTC. So uh, if you're hooking up to, a, to an FTC, uh, be sure that there's male threads, or sorry, female threads. Here's a couple in our area, like this one is at Walmart, I think you can see we've got this round configuration and then here's the actual hookup, but it's with five amps. So just something to think about. Um, completely switching gears again. Uh, remember if we're relay pumping, we wanna be in uh, RPM mode on the governor. Um, and we can use, and the way I kind of remember that, if we have people, we use PSI, relay RPM. Um, the reason we're doing that is let's say we had a supply engine supplying an attack engine with a three inch line, right? If both of these engines are, are in PSI mode on the governor, when they start flowing water, this governor is gonna see that increase in flow and increase RPM to maintain pressure. That same exact water is going through this hose. So if this governor's in uh, PSI mode, it's gonna sense that and it's gonna increase its pressure. Then as it increases its pressure, this sees a pressure increase coming in, so it starts coming down and they start, they start kind of battling each other. So this engine stays in RPM mode and they're just supplying a fixed pressure just like they were a fire hydrant. So people PSI mode, relay RPM. Our relay rule of thumb, uh, pumping 100 PSI in RPM mode to start. Um, and then we have a formula of 20 PSI for nozzle pressure, friction loss, appliance elevation, if we need to factor something in. We account for this 20 PSI. So for example, going back a slide, we don't want this engine to go below 20 PSI. So if I'm manually calculating uh, the uh, pressure for this, I would say, okay, this is my nozzle and I use 20 PSI for this nozzle because uh, I don't want them to go below 20 PSI and then I figure out the rest. Uh, I don't want to go into that here in a lot of detail. If you have any questions, reach out, I'm glad to answer. Um, how we got that rule of thumb of 100 PSI we kind of took a common uh, rural problem. So let's say we have two inch and three quarter lines flowing and we're like, man, what would that look like if we had 300 feet of supply hose, which I think in a rural situation would be really short. And what would it be if we had thousand feet, which I think we could all agree would be a long supply. Throw some elevation in there. 100 PSI works in all those situations. So, um, so that's kind of where we came up with that. Uh, we're like, that, that'll, that'll, that'll work pretty well. So it's not just pulled out of the air. It's, it's kind of figured off some common situations that we might run into. Um, switching gears again, uh, especially with the electronic valves on the engines, it can be really difficult to dial in um, a lower pressure if you've already got a higher pressure line in service. So let's say I've got an inch and three quarter in service. I'm putting in a two and a half at like 70 PSI versus the 130 that I'm at. Uh, how open your valve is, especially if you're on the electronic, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense a lot. You're like, man, why does my valve opening at 20%? And then why in the lower throw of that valve am I getting so much more water with a tiny touch of that valve? Well, this is why. So if you look at these three valve positions, so here uh, is a valve completely off, right? And we have the interior of the, of the ball of the valve is completely shut. Well, you can see this valve is now on. And I think if we call that, I don't know, let's call it 30% open. If you look at the ball valve, I'm really only like, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, 10% open right here. That's because this valve has to unseat before it starts showing water. So that's why when you're bringing water in from a hydrant with those things, you're not going to, you're not going to, with those intake uh, ball valves, you're not going to see water a lot of times until you hit that 20, 30% mark. So uh, this is why, and this is also why when you're discharging a line, sometimes it feels like you're really pulling that valve out quite a bit before you start showing water. Um, once again, with this one, let's call this, I don't know, 70% open. And we see now we're about 50% open. So if I'm making adjustments to line pressure, I've only got this much margin of error to work with. That's why like if you have a line going in service at 130 and you bring another one in at like 70, just a little tiny touch can have a big effect on there because your valve's not very open, even though it looks or feels open. So that's kind of what's going on inside with the mechanics. Switching gears again, hydro transfers. Just remember when we do hydro transfers, um, we're very used to just hooking up, like do it, like spotting a hydrant with a pony section, maybe putting a line in service. But remember when we get, you know, two, three, four, 500 feet of five inch down, that is a ton of air that needs to come out of that line. And I, well, something that's very common I see with a lot of DOs is they only bleed it for, you know, that they, they bleed it until they get that first little spurt of water and then they shut it. Well, if you really run a lot of water out, man, that thing will spurt forever. And I, I know DOs have a big sense of urgency for getting that hydrant water to the engine, but remember, we're trying to have a smooth hydrant transfer. And we have a timer on our engine, and our timer is our water gauge. 
So unless you're just flashing water, there's no need to bring that in quickly. So really take your time, bleed that, bleed that air out before you uh, let it come into the engine. Remember, we don't always need to use five inch. Three inch is a, is a great supply line. Um, we need to do some more research on this, but I'm having some conversations with some people about looking at our flows from three inch from hydrants, possibly dressing hydrants with gate valves, transitioning to some of that, depending on the house size. Five inch is just huge overkill for a lot of our fires. So uh, I'm not saying to lay three inch in, we have a lot of work to do around that, but uh, it's something uh, that you might see coming up uh, in a while as we start uh, flushing that stuff out. Um, and then remember that pressure is additive. So if you're doing a hydro transfer um, and you're in a uh, pressure stage on the governor, so at idle, you're running at about 100 PSI. Um, you bring in 100 PSI hydro, which is not uncommon in our area, especially the further east you get. Pressure is additive. So if we have 100 PSI hydrant, water goes through the first imp imp uh, impeller. We're pumping in series, so it goes through the second impeller. So we started with 100, we gained 50, gained 50. At idle, I'm at 200 PSI, at idle. So I'm having to get, as I'm bringing that hydrant in, I'm having to gate back that discharge line in order to, to compensate for that. Because my governor can't go below idle to compensate for that. If I pump in volume stage, um, it, it helps. It doesn't make it go away, but it helps. So now I'm pumping in, in, um, in parallel, I'm not series. So I'm only gaining 50 PSI total, not 100. So I bring in 100 PSI hydrant, now I'm at 150. Well, now I have to gate back a lot less. Um, another thing we can do, and I think it's on this slide, yep, is pumping with the brakes on. I have started doing this and I am becoming a huge, huge, huge fan of this. So that's where, let's say I, I'm first into a structure fire on the DO, right? What I'm liking to do now is pumping that 130 line about, man, about 170, maybe even a little bit more, 180, as high as 200, and then I'll gate back that first line. Um, and that's pumping with the brakes on. And I'd really encourage you to experiment with this. It makes hydrant transfers go so smoothly. So you pump, you know, let's say you pump at 170, 180 PSI, then you gate back your line to 130. When that hydrant comes in, now you do have RPMs that can come down as that hydrant comes in. Um, the more I've done it, the more I've been a fan of it. Uh, I was teaching it more at the DO Academy this year. I saw a lot of success when we did hydrant transfers in there. I would really encourage you to go out there and mess with it. Um, <clears throat> switching gears again, gauge locations and what that means on the engine. Uh, kind of a confusing picture. We'll see if I can walk you through it. We've got our pump and then we have the beginning of our discharge manifold on our pump, right? And then we have a split from foam lines to non-foam lines. Um, and then as we get down our foam lines here, we have a gauge, I'm sorry, a valve, uh, a gauge, and then a drain, right? So water's coming um, through here, out through our, through our valve, and then out to our, to our nozzle down here. So uh, a common mistake I see a lot of DOs make is that they focus on that uh, pump discharge pressure gauge uh, for what their uh, for their engine pressure or for their line pressure and the problem with that is that the pickup for this line pressure gauge the pressure pickup could be anywhere it could be right here uh, it could be further down um, so th it's very common to see friction loss uh, happen in between the main discharge gauge which is the, the big gauge on the engine and the line pressure gauge so it's very common for a line, you know, putting in a line at 130, our pump discharge gauge is gonna read 140 and our line pressure gauge is gonna read 130. So just a friendly reminder to look at that uh, line pressure gauge when you're setting your pressures, not the pump discharge pressure gauge. Remember that we do have a pump capacity issue. Um, our pumps are designed to flow 1500 GPM at a draft uh, at 150 PSI. You get above 150 PSI, your pump capacity goes down. Uh, to um, 70% and then you go to 250 PSI, it goes down 50%. Remember that's at a draft, which we're almost never doing. So a hydrant helps with that. But just, just a friendly reminder to keep it in your head that uh, we, we don't have unlimited pump capacity and the higher your pressure gets, uh, the uh, lower, the less efficient your pump is. If we're pumping to the aerials, uh, we wanna start pumping them at 150 and then we'll use the truck crew to help us out. Uh, they have pressure gauges on them and flow meters, uh, we can use flow meters on the engine, and uh, we're starting at 150, we're seeing what that stream looks like, and we're going from there. Uh, we're gonna really be relying on that communication with, uh, with the truck crew to increase or decrease pressure, so um, that's kind of our standard for that. We always wanna maintain 20 PSI residual. Remember, anytime you're putting big water in service, you wanna maintain that 20 PSI residual so we don't collapse uh, water main. This is especially important on something like a penny flats fire where we're gonna be tapping multiple hydrants, and we don't want to like we want to have that reserve in case we tap a hydrant um, 
on the same main. Use our high pressure hose uh, in between the engine and the aerial. Uh, and then remember, you may be the only valve. Um, some of the aerials don't have uh, like an intake valve that they can turn it on and off with. So if they need to shut off water, you need to be able to do that right away. So be in a position to, to help them with that. Um, we also want to use all the ports from the hydrants anytime we're working from big water. And this is kind of what that looks like. So ideally we pump the engine close to the hydrant, tap all the ports, because we're going to get way more water out of it if we tap both these uh, two and a half inch ports, as well as the steamer connection. Uh, and then we would want to, if, if necessary, we'd increase our distance from the engine to the aerial, but this is kind of what we're after in any sort of big water situation if you're trying to maximize water out of a hydrant. Tap all your ports. A couple trips as, a, as you train. Uh, we pump from a draft a lot when we train. Uh, it's just a great way to not waste water. Um, don't forget your residual pressure on that intake gauge. It's something that I know I personally forget all the time with as much as I try to stay involved with this. It takes me a couple days every DO Academy to be like, oh yeah, static and residual, um, even, with, even with as much as I think about it. So I forget about it. Um, I'm sure it's a common thing, so just something to think about. I mentioned we have that DO uh, notebook in the Conix box. It's got a bunch of pump problems in there. It's got pump tables and pump charts and all sorts of tools in there for you to use as you're training. So uh, feel free to use that when you're out at the pump pit. Uh, just be sure to put it back because uh, the DO uh, uh, testing candidates do use that quite a bit. Uh, do remember also when you're out at the pump pit, part of what's in that book is this uh, illustration that shows about, it, it, what you're trying to do is match, somewhat match your flows and pressures with the, with the, uh, with the pump pit manifold discharges. Um, so the idea is these are meant to simulate an inch and three quarter. So you wanna be flowing inch and three quarter ish lines to that because if you, if you just call it whatever you want and you hook it up to let's say one that's designed to be a blitz fire, simulate a blitz fire, then all of a sudden you're over pumping your engine by hundreds of GPM. And then you hook up another one and before you know it, you think you're like, oh, why is my engine screaming? I should only be pumping 100 or 360 GPM here when you're actually pumping you know, 1000 GPM because you hooked up to the wrong ports. So it's important when you're out there to try to hook up, try, try to simulate hooking up to somewhat common flows and somewhat realistic. Like if you're charging number five, make sure number five is your two and a half and make sure you're hooked up to something that's simulating a two and a half. Uh, this illustration shows about uh, what those are. So just realize that these ports aren't all the same and that it can kind of jack up your, 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 um, your sense of how loud your engine should be with what it should actually be pumping. Hopefully that makes sense. So wrapping up, just a couple more trips as we train. Um, we talked about that, we pump from a draft a lot. Uh, we don't always need to supply with five inch. Um, think about that as a DO, you know, I, I would pump the, I was a very early in my career, I saw, um, I was working at a pump or fighting a trash fire, um, just a simple trash fire. And they laid like 400 feet of five inch in there to, to put that thing out. And I was like, man, that's a, that's a lot of overkill. So just something to think about. Uh, the only thing that gets a dry erase marker off uh, is dry erase cleaner or uh, rubbing alcohol. Um, just remember that when you're out at the pit and it's not coming off because the sun kind of baked it on, just don't grab some zip and scrub it with a white ball or you're going to scratch the paint. So just keep an eye on that. Um, and then uh, don't write on the red stripes of the engines. We've had a couple cases where we've had to uh, replace the striping. Uh, because that gets baked into the striping and then we couldn't get that uh, get that marker off. So if you can avoid it, don't paint on the red striping. We talked about that DO Conics box. And then, you know, as we send out these problems to work um, in the in your DO packet or your DO task book, um, you know, try to take those out to the engine and run them like you would and mark your gauges and practice using your pump table and your pump chart and all that. Um, I think it really kind of, it, it makes the, the it makes it more valuable training out of just, uh, you know, doing it with a pen and paper on a, uh, on a table. So, um, and then as always, uh, the feedback, uh, is a huge part of the DO program. So whether you're uh, a new or senior DO and you've got feedback from beginning to end on anything in the process, uh, please let us know. Um, if you've got ideas for training or you want to be involved and be part of the DO committee, we're always looking for, for people. We've got a, a kind of a pumping and a driving section of the DO committee. There's a lot of work to be done on the driving section um, with, you know, whether we go with, you know, NFA or Smith system or what kind of training we're going to do. So if that's something you'd want to be involved in, um, by all means, reach out. Uh, chief Macarini is the, is the chief of the DO uh, committee uh, working under with Captain Hamden. And then 
um, it kind of breaks out from there, but it's largely separated into pumping and driving. If, if this all, if this is all stuff that gets you excited and something you want to be involved in, we're always looking for people. I'm always looking for instructors in the DO Academy, new ideas, new classes. Um, so please reach out. Um, this isn't, this isn't a silo. It's meant to be for everybody. So, um, please reach out. Uh, I thought that'd be an appropriate COVID related 2020, the end slide with a little bit of the world, world burning. So, um, anyway, thanks for paying attention. Hopefully you got something out of this. Any feedback, let us know. Um, hope you're doing well.